Right, so I'll just jump straight into it. Um, and I'll be talking about cholesterol homeostasis and protein homeostasis using this enzyme as an example to illustrate their um, connections. So again, you know, my name is Jake. I recently finished my PhD in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's about three and a half years PhD here. Um, and working on my PhD, I, I studied this enzyme scalding monoxygenase or scalding epoxidase. And that's really brought me into the realm, the world of like lipids and protein quality control. So I'll talk about these two quite a fair bit. And uh, I started my postdoc four weeks ago now, so it's a fresh new postdoc. Um, most of the stuff today has been published and most of my PhD is published. So I'll just focus on the big picture so you can look up the papers if you want to. And if, if you can't remember anything, just you know, know that I work squatting monoxygenase, cholesterol, and if you couldn't. So I'll go into this a little bit more detail now. Um, let's first talk about how cells make cholesterol and how do we know when to stop making it, when do we make enough of it. If you've never heard of cholesterol, it's an important lipid. It's virtually involved in a lot of research areas out there. So chances are you're also working on something quite uh, related to cholesterol as well. Um, I'm quite lucky because in this field, there's a lot of uh, history and also Nobel laureates involved in making these amazing discoveries. One of it is the um, cholesterol synthesis pathway. So the take home message for this is that if you don't have enough, have enough cholesterol in your cells, your cells want to make more and they'll make more using this pathway here. And if you have enough cholesterol, then you stop the production from this pathway. So that's how you control how much you make at a time. Um, I'll try to put references or citations, sorry, to um, relevant people with the first and last authors um, and the full names. I think that's easier to find the um, work. So coming back to the pathway, um, I want to focus on two examples. There are two rate limiting enzymes of this pathway. They control how much um, cholesterol is produced through this pathway. So there's HMG co reductase and squalium monoxygenase. You might have come across statins. They're very famous drugs. They are used to inhibit this enzyme, HMG co reductase. And a lot of the work underpinning the regulation of this enzyme was actually discovered um, by the Nobel laureates Brown and Goldstein. And my PhD advisor has worked with them. Later on, he started his lab and then showed the existence of this other, the, sorry, he discovered the mechanisms underlying how this enzyme works as a rate lifting enzyme. And I started later on, so hopefully something amazing happens later on. Um, so with excess cholesterol, how does this enzyme actually work? So with excess cholesterol, this actually triggers the modification of squalium monoxygenase. So it ubiquitinates it, and then it triggers it for degradation. So by doing this, it actually can then shut down the pathway production of cholesterol. So this is a nice feedback mechanism. And this enzyme has been around for a few decades now. And initially, there was a lot of interest to study it for lowering cholesterol levels in, around this period. And in recent years, there's a lot of big cancer papers out there linking it to cancer metabolism. And the enzyme itself has been linked to uh, Rett syndrome and also the uh, regeneration of human pluripotent button stem, stem cells, cardiac organoids as well. So there's a lot of literature around it in recent years. Um, so switching gears, we'll forget the lipids and we'll come, come back to it soon. Now we'll talk about ubiquitin. And ubiquitin itself has also its own uh, richness of history and discoveries in Nobel laureates. So what happens is that proteins, when they can be, they can be modified by ubiquitin, so ubiquitin gets added onto these lysine amino acids. And there's a lot of these enzymes that are need needed. There's 40 of these and 600 of these. This leads to a lot of different outcomes. So all these outcomes have very huge wide ranging impacts on physiology, like immunity, metabolism. And you might have come across Parkin, which is an E3 enzyme and very much involved in Parkinson's disease. Um, this is just a bit of a side note, actually. Your substrate proteins can be modified by ubiquitin in many ways. You can have a single ubiquitin, two ubiquitin, and some proteins have ubiquitin joined in different ways. So there's a lot of branches and very complicated code. And ubiquitin is also a protein, which means it can be modified by other modifications like you know, gummy bears of acetylation or even you know, um, jelly beans of, of phosphorylation. So there's a lot of um, signatures going on. A subset of ubiquitin research is um, endoplasmic reticulum associated degradation or ERAD. So what happens is that in the endoplasmic reticulum, when you're making proteins, if they're not made properly, they, they need to be get rid of, they need to be removed. So what happens is that they get removed by ERAD. 
And what happens is that they get ubiquitinated, as you can see here, and then they get degraded. But this also happens for full mature proteins, fully native mature proteins. If you don't need them in the endoplasmic reticulum, you get rid of them. So this example, one example is squalene monoxygenase, where it gets ubiquitinated when there's high cholesterol, and then it gets removed. So I guess the key take-home message for this part is that you know, ERAD is important in metabolism. There's other papers talking about its role in obesity, in lipid homeostasis, and you know, mitochondrial dynamics. So there's a lot of um, literature out there on this. So I guess coming back to kind of the focus of what I've been working on for the past few years is the ERAD of squalene monoxygenase. And as I said, squalene monoxygenase is degraded in response to cholesterol. And what is remarkable is that if this 100 amino acids is um, gone, this process doesn't take place. So what is essential is that this 100 amino acids can sense cholesterol in the environment. And when you put it onto a protein like GFP, even GFP, which is normally stable, can sense cholesterol and be degraded. So this is very remarkable because this is a transferable signal. And we call it a degron. The field calls it a degron. So it's a transferable degradation signal. What's even more remarkable is that this 100 amino acids is only found in higher organisms like um, humans and mammals, but it's completely absent in lower organisms like yeast, suggesting it may have evolved over time to allow this cholesterol sensing capacity. Yeast don't make cholesterol, they make a different kind of sterols. So squalene monoxygenase has been around for a while, but it was only last year that someone solved the catalytic domain structure but this 100 amino acids is still not known. We don't know the structure, and it's very important because this regulates the activity of the enzyme. So another PhD student at the time showed that the degron, this 100 amino acids, is anchored into the endoplasmic reticulum with this loop structure right here. So it goes in and comes out. So my job was really to figure out how this degron can enable regulation. So I was trying to find motifs and protein residues that are important for this. One of the things we did do is to mutate every second amino acid into an alanine, and uh, we basically express them in cells and test each of the mutants to see, okay, is, are they degraded by cholesterol? Are they not? Are they yes or no? Uh, that was a lot of cloning, but with minimal return. But we got something eventually. Um, what we did find eventually is that something we didn't notice before is this helix here. This helix we think can sense cholesterol, so we chop this region out. So what you can see is that with the wild type degron, so the normally when you add cholesterol, it's degraded. If you get rid of the helix, it can no longer be degraded by cholesterol. That basically formed kind of the basis of the first paper where we think, okay, there's cholesterol coming in to the membrane, this helix can sense the cholesterol and then becomes deformed and then it gets degraded because this is a hydrophobic kind of like eat me signal now. So the question isn't quite complete because for proteins to be degraded, they need to be modified by ubiquitin. So there's a gap here, there's a missing link as to how it can then be shuttled away for degradation. So we're asking then, where is it modified by ubiquitin? The earlier I told you that um, substrates can be modified by ubiquitin on these lysine amino acids. So what we did was that, and then when they get modified, they can be degraded. So what we have is this construct here. Normally, it has like all this lysine residues. So again, wild type, you add cholesterol, it's degraded. But the lab generated a lysineless construct, so you get rid of the lysines, so you get rid of the ubiquitination site, so it shouldn't be degraded. But when you add cholesterol, it's still degraded. So that's telling us it's not lysines. Um, sorry, that's just the wild type, and that's the um, mutant there. So what we did later on is to mutate more. So it turns out that amino acids like serine, treonine, and cysteine can be ubiquitinated. So what we found this time is you mutate things in patches and different clusters, hoping to then find maybe there's a group of residues that's required. Um, to kind of, this is just for illustration. Basically, we then tested more mutants and found you can see there's some mutants which is really strongly expressed. You add cholesterol, it's not degraded. Like wild type, it's normally degraded with cholesterol. Eventually, using mass spectrometry and other analyses, we narrow it down to these four residues, 59, 61, 83, 87, as the top residues for ubiquitination and their top priority. And mass spectrometry could confirm um, serum 83 is modified. That kind of reiterated the model for the next paper, where we then showed, okay, the helix, when there's high cholesterol, it unfolds. And what happens is that around these residues here are serum residues where it can be ubiquitinated, and then it gets degraded. 
But one of the biggest questions as well is that this, this region here, it's really hydrophobic. This whole thing is a membrane protein. And so how do you get it out of the membrane? It has to be some, there's some, has to be something to get it out. It turns out that the structure was actually solved without the N100 domain as well, because there's other precedences as well for this protein being hard to um, produce. And it could just be because it's a recombinant protein. Uh, sorry, it just could, could be because it's a membrane protein. Cool. And we had a candidate, and that was balancing containing protein. This protein basically, we think, actually pulls out the squatting monoxygenase protein. Um, it's kind of involved in a number of like degradation of other substrates in the endoplasmic reticulum as well. So what we've done is to add, inhibitor, add an inhibitor to the cells to block this protein. And you can see in the DMSO control, if you add cholesterol, the protein is degraded, full length SM is degraded. But when we add an inhibitor, you get this 10 to 15 fold increase. And that's quite striking, I think, in biology as well. So that kind of gives us an indication, okay, this thing is a protein that helps to extract squalene oxygenase out. So I think I just want to you know, sum up all that work in this schematic, just to say that this N100 domain is very important because you don't want catalytic activity of the cholesterol synthesis pathway to go unregulated. You need to stop it when it's not necessary. So this domain basically helps to regulate the catalytic activity of this enzyme. So what we've got is this um, domain, which can sense cholesterol in the uh, membrane. And with excess cholesterol, it deforms the helix. And when this happens, it gets modified by ubiquitin on these nearby residues. And then this protein called VCP kind of pulls it out. Um, I didn't discuss these two proteins, but they're also necessary for uh, modifying if ubiquitin. Other than our cells have shown this. Cool. Um, I just want to conclude with some other take-home messages, I guess, that Dagron's is kind of a kind of a neglected feel, I would say, to some extent. And I think this not this statement from this paper really nicely says it, saying that you know um, Dagron discovery can have more benefits in cancer therapeutics. In fact, in recent years, there are people who are trying to hijack the ubiquitin machinery, like this protein degradation mechanism, to um, degrade selective proteins that cause diseases. Cool, and um, I think I've also learned, hopefully you can appreciate now that membrane proteins are highly dynamic in the sense that they can sense the lipids in the environment, like lipids are charged, they can bend in different ways, this affects protein binding, this affects the activity of some proteins, whether or not they can act as transcription factors. Um, and I think one of the things in the field is that generally it was taught that cholesterol homeostasis proteins like HMG code reductase, they can sense the sterols in the environment using these transmembrane domains. But we've shown that it's not just transmembrane domains, it could also be these loops or these helices as well. Um, and given the current situation in the world, I thought I was just chucking a virus example. Uh, it turns out, you know, like influenza viruses can also bind to cholesterol using antipathic helices. And cholesterol has kind of been this important lipid for helping uh, viruses to infect and bud and things like, uh, and other things like that. And these unique structures, like these loops and the helices, they're also found in other famous proteins, like alpha-synuclein, cabiolin, and lipid droplet proteins as well have a lot of these structures because um, these organelles, in a way, they're monolayers. They don't fit transmembrane domains. So proteins that are found here usually have helices and also um, loops. And the thing as well that I come across, uh, I've learned is that you know in undergraduate biochemistry they say that okay lysine ubiquitination that's the one, but then you come across all these rare modifications in literature, and ours is one of the twenty or so examples that serine ubiquitination can happen. It's rare, but it does happen. Um, and I just want to say as well, all the stuff I've shown you with the helix and the loop and the ubiquitination, it's kind of like part of the stuff I've been doing over the years, but. Uh, a lot of the other stuff for squalene monoxygenase has been done in the lab by other PhD students prior to this. Um, I didn't have time to show you all the work that went into it, but basically for this 100 amino acids, we've made over 100 mutations trying to study it. And a lot of it was actually learning from evolution, so learning from other proteins, other degrons. Um, and I think there's a lot of fundamental understanding of lipid biology and ubiquitin biology that was contributed by other people in the field as well. So it's not like we discover everything from scratch. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that, you know, the regulation of lipid metabolism, or in this case, cholesterol metabolism, is tightly linked with uh, protein quality control machineries. And with that, I would like to thank um, everyone that I've worked with in the, uh, over the past few years, and against Carmen for um, helping to organize this. All right, I think that's pretty much it.